Hi there, everyone. My name is Priyaj Juthani. I'm a third year internal medicine resident at Stanford. And today I'm going to be walking you through cardiology 101. But specifically, cardiology encompasses such a wide breadth of material. But today we'll be focusing on heart failure. Heart failure is a very common condition that almost anyone needs to know how to manage. Heart failure specifically refers to your heart's inability to pump blood forward and get it to where it needs to be. When it can't do that, we all often term it as failing, and I'm going to be going over what exactly that means, how to diagnose heart failure, how to treat it, and ultimately how to make sure your patients get the best care. This video is intended for medical students as well as residents, but if you're even just outside and just interested in overall heart failure management, I encourage you to keep watching. The source for this video comes from two separate things. One is the Core I Am podcast that talks about five pearls on inpatient heart failure. This is a lovely podcast that's intended, again, for mostly residents, but I'm going to be taking a lot of this and distilling it down. The second thing is this lovely thing, which is called the Wiki Journal Club. A lot of what we know now about heart failure, and also more broadly just medicine, comes from things called clinical trials, where you randomize, to, randomize patients to two different types of interventions and see what works. The good part about cardiology is that they're so insanely evidence-based that there's trials for a lot of the things I'm going to be talking to you about today. And so you'll be seeing me refer to those trials just to show you this is where we get this information from. And as I told you, cardiology is a very, very big topic. I want you to remember that when someone comes in with shortness of breath or chest pain, it's very easy to assume that it's the heart, but oftentimes you often need to step back and crest a very broad differential. That's often the beauty of medicine. You can very easily anchor on one thing, but the beauty of being a hospitalist and also a more broadly just a doctor is to remember that there's so many other things that could be going on and you always want to consider those things because otherwise when you anchor, you often can one, get the wrong diagnosis, but two, often subject patients to unnecessary treatments. So remember, someone comes in with shortness of breath, don't ever just assume it's the heart. While the heart is really important and you always want to rule out an underlying heart attack, you also should be thinking about other things, right? Like a pulmonary embolism, a dissection, a uh, tamponade, which is when uh, fluid builds up around the heart. You can also consider things such as the heart attack that I told you about, which is known as ischemia or acute coronary syndrome. But remember, someone comes in with shortness of breath or even chest pain, the things that affect this area is not necessarily always the heart. You can have underlying GI issues. So you can have GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. You can have Burhoff syndrome, where if you've been vomiting recently, you can often have a tear in your esophagus. Similarly, you can also have palm uh, issues, right? Because this is also where the lungs are. So some of the lung issues that can happen are pneumonia, pneumothorax, asthma. And then similarly, uh, you can also think about psychiatric conditions such as a panic attack. That's kind of my 30,000 foot view. But today, as I told you, we're going to be talking about heart failure. So if someone comes in with hypoxia and you think that it's actually heart failure, how are you going to diagnose that? Basically, the classic presentation of heart failure is that someone comes in with exertional dyspnea. What does that mean? They often walk and then they get short of breath. This is because when you walk, you increase the cardiac demand on your heart. Your blood has to pump to all the areas of your body, and oftentimes it needs to pump more readily because, again, when you're walking, you're, um, you're activating your aerobic respiration cycles much more readily, and for that reason, you need to get oxygen from your blood, from the lungs, to those regions that need it. You can also often have orthopnea, which is often known as paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. And this happens because the whole day you might be standing up, but the moment you go to lay flat, you actually get short of breath. And part of that is because your heart has a tougher time getting blood to where it needs to be. You also can have shortness of breath because if someone has underlying heart failure, the, the heart can't pump blood as blood forward. And that often means that blood backs up. And one of the things it backs up into is the lungs. So that leads to shortness of breath. The big ways that we classify heart failure is actually based on something called ejection fraction. We look at someone's underlying heart using an echo, and when we look at that echo, we can see how well is their left ventricle contracting. If that left ventricle is contracting well, and they still have signs of heart failure where they're short of breath, maybe they have fluid in their lungs, maybe they have lower extremity edema, then they're, um, they're often diagnosed with what's called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So they have symptoms of heart failure, but their ejection fraction is actually pretty normal. But if their ejection fraction is low, we call that heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Reduced ejection fraction implies an ejection fraction less than 40%. Preserved ejection fraction usually implies an ejection fraction greater than 50%. 
Again, the way we often diagnose heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is we say that this patient has signs and symptoms of heart failure, but then we also often refer to this score, which is known as the um, heart H2FPEF score. And the way you know that is if they are old age, if they have underlying um, diastolic dysfunction, if they have atrial fibrillation, all of these things can help us support the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, well, that's easy to diagnose because all you need is a low EF and signs of heart failure, right? So that now brings us to, okay, you have diagnosed heart failure. You either say this patient has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, they're having shortness of breath, they have crackles um, in their lungs, they have lower extremity edema, I need to treat it. Or they have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction where we know their EF is fine, but they actually still have all of these stigmata. Well, the next thing you often want to do is think about why do they have this exacerbation? Did they not take their medications recently? Did they recently have a viral infection? Did they end up um, having some underlying trigger that caused them to go into this exacerbation? Oftentimes, you also want to combine this with your exam, right? Do they have edema? Where do they have their edema up till? Do they have edema all the way up to their shins or do they have it all the way up to their thighs? Because that implies much worse um, edema. Do they have an elevated JVD, which is the uh, the vein that leads into the heart? If that's distended, that also tells you that they have heart failure because, again, as I told you, everything's backing up and not moving forward. Um, some of the things you also want to ask them is, hey, what is your dry weight? We often refer to this as something that we think about for all of our cardiology patients. Someone... Um, has their dry weight, which is when all of the fluid is off, when you don't have lower extremity edema, when you don't have crackles in your lungs, what is your weight? If your weight at that time is maybe 150 kilograms and you come in at 175, well, that tells me you probably have 25 extra kilograms of fluid on you that we should probably get off, right? So these are all of the things that you want to think about. What is their diuretic regimen? Have they been taking it? When was their last echo? What was the ejection fraction on that echo? Um, do they have underlying ischemia that you're worried about? Do they come in with crushing substernal chest pain and they could be having a heart attack and maybe that's why they have heart failure exacerbation? So these are all things to consider. Once you know that it's heart failure, basic things that you want to get are labs. You want to get a troponin. Again, you want to rule out that they're having an underlying heart attack and that means that you want to rule out any underlying disease to the heart, which will be reflected with the troponin. You want to get an NT pro BNP because you often don't want to get a true BNP because if someone is taking a neprilysin inhibitor, uh, that often can falsely elevate a BNP. An NT pro BNP is released when the atrial walls are stretched and that is a sign that someone could have heart failure exacerbation because that often means they're stretching a lot more. You want to get strict eyes and nose. You want to make sure that when someone comes into the hospital, you're measuring their ins and outs. You want to get daily weights because you want to measure the weight over time. Because as I said, if they came in at 175 and you want to get them to 150, we should be measuring their weights pretty daily. You want to get a repeat echo, TTE, and you want to check their BMP, which is their um, labs, to make sure their serum sodium is okay because that's often a bad prognostic sign if it's low. Now let's talk about management. Remember, the best thing to do for a patient who comes in with heart failure is get some of those extra fluid off. If you have extra fluid, that's not helping you because it's increasing the amount of weight that people have. But more importantly, it also prevents the heart from doing what it needs to do. If you have lower extremity edema, that's not helping more blood get to where it needs to be because you have so much edema surrounding the vessels. So the best thing I usually do is I double the patient's home diuretic dose. So when someone comes in with heart failure exacerbation and they tell me they're taking 40 milligrams of Lasix at home, I double it to 80. And the reason I do that is because one, I know that the 40 was clearly not working for them because they came into the hospital. So doubling it is always a good overall first step. If you don't know the conversions, I have them right here for you. Um, to go, 40 milligrams of Lasix is about one milligram of Bumex oral, right? And then similarly, 40 milligrams of Lasix oral is 20 milligrams of Lasix IV. Uh, 40 milligrams of um, Lasix uh, oral, as I said, is 20 milligrams of Lasix IV, but one milligram of Bumex oral is one milligram of Bumex IV because it's a one-to-one -one conversion. But I've had this chart right here for you, but basically all I do is figure out what they came in with and I usually double it, um, whether that's in an IV form. Sometimes they even have sub-Q now, they have sub-Q furosemide. So just thinking about those things can be very important and helpful. A good dose of a diuretic is something that usually means that you put out around two liters of urine. 
okay? And uh, you'll see here that the dose of the diuretic will keep increasing, but once you're out putting out two liters, if you increase the dose of the diuretic, you're not gonna pull up, put out much more. So at that point, once you're seeing you're giving a dose and they're putting out two liters of urine, you often wanna increase the frequency of that dosing. Increasing the dose itself will not help. So if I see that I give someone 80 milligrams of IV Lasix and they put out two liters, putting them up to 160 is not going to increase uh, the amount they put out anymore. Instead, I'm going to do 80 milligrams, but I might do two times a day. Then I might do three times a day, right? As you do more dosing more frequently, that can be helpful once you've hit that threshold effect. Similarly, the other thing that you want to do when someone comes in with a heart failure exacerbation is something called GDMT, Guideline Directed Medical Therapy. What does that mean? Well, basically, these are things that have been shown to help people who have acute heart failure exacerbations. So once you actually get their fluid off, anyone who has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, aka their ejection fraction is less than 30%, should be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARNI, which is known as an angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor, and Tresto is one of them. They should also be on an SGLT2 inhibitor. They should also be on a beta blocker. Uh, they can also be on a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. These are all four things that are very important to continue to get patients on if they come in with heart failure. Once you get them to a more appropriate volume, starting them on these medications is very important because it has been shown to improve mortality as well as future readmissions. However, let's say they have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. There are certain medications you still want to try to get the patient on. Specifically, there's a class 2A indication to get them on an SGLT2 inhibitor, but then there's also a class 2B recommendation to get them on a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, like spironolactone, as well as an ARNI if possible. Right, so hey, regardless, if they have an SGLT, uh, if they have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, always start with an SGLT2 inhibitor once you get the volume off, and then you can consider adding on um, something like a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist or even an ARNI, but you often don't need a beta blocker. So this is very important. I hope this was helpful. As I said, we went over the differential for heart failure. We went over all of the big things that you can be thinking about. Then I went over heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as well as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We then went over the basic thing that you want to do is to double the home diuretic regimen when they come in. Once they're at a more reasonable volume, these are the meds that you want to consider starting them on if they have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And if they have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, then you want to consider SGLT2 inhibitor. I hope this was helpful. If it was, please drop a like, comment, share, subscribe. I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.